Welcome everyone to our fourth keynote address. I'd like to encourage you all to stay around till the very end of the conference. We've, after Amy, we've got still some great talks to go, and also a screening of the crowd in the cloud at, at around five today. So if you're thinking about sneaking out, please don't. There's lots of excellent, excellent talks still to come. So I'd like to introduce Amy Sterling. And Amy is the executive director of iWire, a game to map the brain. iWire crowdsources neuroscience, challenging hundreds of thousands of players around the world to solve 3D puzzles and map neurons. Amy has advised the White House and the US Senate on crowdsourcing and open innovation. Under her leadership, iWire's neuroscience visualizations have appeared at TED and the United Nations and Times Square in New York City. So please join me in welcoming Amy. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Can you hear me OK? Awesome. Well, hello, I'm Amy. It is an honor and a pleasure to be here. I've been so inspired by all of your amazing projects and by talking with so many of you, I've already got a lot of ideas of interesting types of content and maybe even some try to get our iWires out into the field and off their computers a little bit. Uh, and also, it's a great pleasure to be here in Australia. I, I said this last night, but it's my first time in this amazing country. And I credit Australia with making me interested in biology, looking at all the crazy creatures and the rule breaking that's going on out in the brush here is just a great inspiration to go and explore the world. Um, and speaking of that, I did it. I did some citizen science with ReefWatch with Carl and we saw this creature and did a little survey, a, leaf, a leafy sea dragon. Yeah, and there were some other things as well, but you can't come to a citizen science conference and not do a little bit of citizen science. So <laughs> thanks, ReefWatch, for, for taking me out. Um, I'm going to jump right into you know, the weird things of the brain. Maybe. The brain's so creative. Whoa. <laughs> do you need to see it one more time? <laughs> so amazing. So <laughs> so creative and so clever. You know, we can appreciate the cutest, most amazing things. Ah! <laughs> They're just so cute. Oh my God. <laughs> you know, but we also set out to do serious, real things, right? Like, well, no, maybe not this serious and real. We imagine things that are not actually real. We love the funny, punny type type things. But we do want to create new technology and make the world a better place. Perhaps go out. Oh, we're not. <laughs> we, try, we try and we fail, but we keep trying. We don't give up. And it results in amazing new science and technology and crazy things like putting a car out into deep space so that someday aliens are going to be like, what was going on with those humans on Earth? <laughs> but at the end of the day, you know, all of these amazing things that we do and that we appreciate and that we share with our friends and family, they're all possible because of the brain really, and because of lots of brains working together and drawing on the previous generations and the culture of human society. You know, so what do we have going on in there? You know, the brain, you might think of it like the planet Earth. The outside is gray matter and the regions of the brain are connected through uh, white matter tractography that's shown as these orange cables here. Now, this is a beautiful visualization made by Adam Ghazali at University of California in San Francisco. And it's from an EEG. And what you're seeing is a simulation of activity going on in the brain when someone's improv playing drums. And the sparkling things that you see on the outside, that's populations of neurons that are firing together in synchrony. And as they fire, you know, they're sending information out their axons to connect with other cells. And they fire at different frequencies. Uh, however, you know, looking at the brain from this far away is like looking at the Earth from space. You know, you can see that there are cities, but you don't really know what's going on. You know, each one of those little sparkling dots on the outside is hundreds of thousands or millions of cells. That doesn't give you a picture of how the brain does what it does. 
you just see that it does what it does, which is important to know. However, I think we need to know more. So we can look closer. For example, we're going to zoom in here to the hippocampus. It's a part of the brain that plays a major role in learning and memory. It's so named hippocampus from, uh, because it's shaped like a seahorse from the Greek word uh, for a seahorse. So what you're seeing is as uh, action potentials coming in through dendrites, reaching the somas, the cell bodies of those cells, and going out through the axon, where that each individual cell will make 10,000 or so more or less, it's a great variety uh, of connections with downstream cells. And in this way, you get these circuits, these canonical cortical circuits that process information. Um, but this is sort of, a, again, an artistic interpretation of what's going on. It's a generalization. And if we really want to know, we need to look even closer, all the way down to the individual synapses that connect neurons. So there's about 100 trillion synapses in the brain, and they are changing all the time. So just since I started this talk, if you remember anything that I said, your brain has grown lots of new synapses. And as you're sleeping tonight, if anything I say is like worth remembering, it'll get potentiated while you're asleep. That means the synapses will strengthen. And when you forget it, you know, a week from now, <laughs> or maybe not, that's actually the synapses receding and going away. Um, but mapping the brain at this resolution with synapses is, is thanks to new technology as well as AI. Uh, and the way that it works is we take a small volume of brain and you have to slice it really thin. So each slice is about 16 nanometers in this case. Uh, and then you stain it with heavy metals that are absorbed by the lipid membranes on the outside of the dendrites. And as you scroll through kind of the stack, you can see the outlines of neurons and you're able to kind of color inside the cross-sectional images in order to reconstruct the 3D neurons that have grown within that tissue. This is a visualization from uh, a circuit that we published in Nature in 2014 that was mapped by our gamers in iWire. Now, it's not just the morphology. Uh, we pair the structural connectivity of these cells with their activity, so what causes them to fire in what out in what external circumstances are the neurons firing. If you can combine that with the structure of the cells and the connectivity, then you can actually model why the neuron fires and how the neuron fires and what causes it to propagate a signal downstream. However, it takes a really long time to map neurons. Uh, thousands, it used to take over a thousand hours. Oh, I'll skip that. You guys don't need to hear about it. You can see so much I wear. It used to take you know, a thousand hours or more to map one neuron. And that was without AI. That was using a fancy version of Microsoft Paint where you would go through slice by slice by slice and color it in. New slice, color it in. New slice, color it in. And you're talking tens of thousands of image slices for one single neuron. Really tedious, really monotonous. Uh, and so we introduced uh, an AI that does volumetric segmentation. Uh, and now, you know, 50 hours is a, the best case, best case scenario. It doesn't usually take only 50 hours. Um, and it, and it used, this is a long journey in between 1,000 to 50 hours. Um, but still, you know, there's 80 billion neurons in one brain, even at 50 hours a pop. That's really slow, really tedious, and there's just not enough neuroscientists in the world. So we're faced with this dilemma. Ugh, what do we do? So, of course, we draw inspiration from outside our own field. Uh, from the world of gaming and also from existent citizen science projects like Foldit that proved you can gamify a task that researchers find to be abjectly boring <laughs> and engage the general public who are non-experts in order to help solve those problems. So that's the inspiration and a little bit of the backstory for why we have created iWire, which is a, a game to map the brain. Um, it launched, you know, five years ago and now there's a quarter million people who have signed up and they come from over 150 different countries or from all over the world. And what I'm going to do, I, I did a short demo last night uh, at the public lecture, but I'm going to do a more in-depth demo of iWire because I want to walk you guys through 
Um, a couple of things I think has made the project sticky for a certain population of users, as well as talk a little bit about how we get consensus. You know, how do we know that these reconstructions are accurate? Uh, what changes have we made to our consensus system to dramatically reduce the amount of duplicated effort from our participants? Uh, also, show you guys some of the gamification mechanisms, and then after we do demo, I'll, I'll go back and. Uh, share with you guys a few lessons that we've learned over the years with iWire. Oh, I think it's okay. I think dark's probably better. Because it... Yeah. All right. So let's see. I'm going to zoom this in. Oh, I'm in a cube right now. I'll say hey to them. Hey guys, we're live at, can you guys read this chat? Should I zoom in? Yeah, yeah? okay, I'll, I'll zoom in a little. Oh, Citizen Science Association. Great, so there's, there's players online right now. I've had this game open for a while, but when I first got on, there were 64 players online in the English channel and one lone Korean. <laughs> um, yeah, so, so all right, so they're saying hey. That's so great. It's in the middle of the night in, uh, in America and Europe. Um, so let me just first walk you guys through the, like, the interface. Um, for, how many of you guys were at the public lecture last night? Okay, so a lot of you guys were, so I'll try to not duplicate kind of what, we saw, what was talked about uh, last night, but there might be a little bit of that. So this neuron that's currently being reconstructed by players is one of many. There is a change cell menu that allows players to choose between a number of different cells and they're graded by how difficult the cubes in the cell are. So, I don't know. <laughs> oh wait, we're live. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> live on a huge screen. <laughs> <laughs> They say, hey. <laughs> okay, LOLs from the audience. Okay, yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, okay. I don't want the, I, I don't want them to leave iWire. I want them to stay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they should, they'll watch it later for sure. Uh, okay, so what we have uh, in the interface, we've got the start playing button, which I will get to, and that's how you actually contribute to the science. Um, and then there's chat as well. These are my personal stats. So I've done 1,935 cubes. For reference, this guy Nesteroff is our top player of all time. And he's done 300,746 cubes. He's a beast at iWire, and he's, he's, he's really amazing. He pulls like, the whole community forward. Um, and this is our leaderboard for today. So there's a lot of, yeah, that's, that's just, actually this is, right now we're doing a Godzilla neuron monster versus sentient AI challenge, <laughs> as one does <laughs> in a neuroscience AI game. Um, so we do regular kind of competitions in the game. And then this little thing up here is what we call the activity tracker. Uh, and so this gives you feedback on the past tasks that you have completed in iWire. So um, when the, the different colors indicate different statuses of the cube as well as your accuracy. So when you do a cube and other players do the cube after you, it compares what you did with what they did uh, relative to the accuracy of all the players. And if you have a high accuracy, your vote matters more than if you have a low accuracy. Um, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. They're telling you about the competition, the team competition. <laughs> Kaiju is this uh, neuron Godzilla monster, which I have a picture in a later slide. You're probably curious. Um, <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's, I'll just start playing so you guys can actually see what this weird interface actually looks like. So um, this is a cube, it's a small volume of brain, four and a half microns on each side. And then these are, as I'm scrolling through on the right hand side, these are the electron microscope images where each pixel is 16 nanometers. And you know, as you kind of scroll through, you see these little oval-like guys that are moving across. It's cross-sections of neurons. So like if 
it's like a tree branch. If you slice it into coins, you can see the outline of the neuron branch. And what you're trying to do is map this one piece of one neuron from one side of the cube all the way to the other side, or else find the end of a branch. I love that they're just chatting for their teams. These are on opposing teams, so they're going to do light trash talking. <laughs> 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 oh, okay, so <laughs> so this little blue thing that's over here, this is the cross section, and what we're doing is we're trying to color just this one piece of this neuron, um, and it's it's not super easy actually, but I'm going to go to the end right here, where you see there's kind of a sort of a jagged edge, so neurons are of course, biological, and they're smooth, they're kind of flowy. So anytime there's something that looks kind of jagged or sharp, that's a sign that something's missing or something is wrong. So this is a good old instance of human insight that you know, gives, uses the contextual awareness of what seems right to figure out what to add. Uh, but it's not just you know, what you think. <laughs> the audience loves this. <laughs> I mean, like, they like chat more than the game. <laughs> okay, so, so right here, if I'm kind of, uh, I'm hiding this. What I'm trying to, I'm going to click, I don't know if you guys can, can see this, but this little blue thing is outlined right here, and it's colored in, and if I keep scrolling through, it's not colored in all the way anymore. So if I click to color inside this small little area, <laughs> Roaring laughter. <laughs> so great. This is why live demos are just so the best. <laughs> okay, so we're going to keep scrolling through, and actually, it looks like. Okay, so we got a little weird flat thing right there which I'm going to click to add in. This is a good example of where uh, it's not always super clear where the boundaries are of the cell. Like this could, could sort of be split, but we're going to use the 3D over here. And we're going to keep scrolling through and add in all these little dust pieces just to make sure that we get a smooth branch with nothing missing because there could be a fork point anywhere. So you have to color in everything. And if you miss a fork, then you miss a branch. Your accuracy drops, you get little points, and you're shamed. Not really, <laughs> Not really but <laughs> we don't shame anyone. This is science. Uh, all right, so we've got this, this branch, which this looks sort of a little knobbly, but you know, if you zoom in, it does look pretty smooth, and it's contiguous here. So we've got this branch, and I'm going to hit Submit. Uh, on this cube, and if the other players who did this cube mapped it the same way, I'll get some points. And if they also mapped it to exit the cube at this point over there, then iWire is going to spawn a new cube that starts with the endpoint of this first one. And that's how we go cube by cube by cube to map out these neurons. So I'll hit submit. As a trailblazer, that means I was the first person to do this cube. So we assign points based on consensus, and if there's only one person who's done the cube, there's no consensus. So I'll get a token amount of points for doing this, and when other players do this cube, it will retroactively give me points for the volume that I added. If I do onward, it'll take me to a new cube. And this, you might think you just go ad infinitum and map cubes forever. However, that is not the case, because in iWire, it is a game, and so games have a leveling system. Uh, ours is a little bit non-conventional um, in that it's not quite as exposed, and it's a little bit of manual promotion. You know, in the same way that you guys, you know, can trust certain of your slide. <laughs> the same way that you can trust certain of your citizen scientists who you know very well to be experts. I wear it the same way. So I know these players. We talk to them. Yeah, they're, they're coordinating their top-level activities, Mystic. Um, but we know them, and we interact with them. So they're not only trustworthy individuals who we have rapport with, um, but they have to demonstrate that they have spent a lot of time in the game and that they have a lot of expertise. So as they level up, they, they migrate from only playing cubes to interacting with the overview. And so what these players will do is go up really close to any one of these branches. So everywhere that it's blue, 
that it's dark blue here, it means that that branch, after it was initially mapped in a cube, has been touched by one of these power players. And they can go in and what's called inspect a cube. So in this case, rather than them starting from scratch, they see what the consensus was from all the other players, and it gives them an opportunity to fix anything that's wrong. So in the same way that in a cube we were looking for sharp edges or anything that was jagged, you can look in overview to see if anything looks wrong. And I know maybe from first glance, like, how would you ever know that something is wrong in this gnarly looking thing? <laughs> but these top players are really good and they spent a lot of time and they understand what to look for, what looks right, what feels wrong in the game. Uh, and they have these extra tools, it's like Scout's Log, so right now there's five tasks that need the attention of a scythe, which is our uh, is sort of like a, a top-ranked player. There's one class above it that unlocks a totally new data set. Uh, and I should mention that this whole feature that's like the organization panel for all of our top-ranked players was built by a player. So was this. When I click on my profile, all these like nice stats that show me what I've done, that was built by a player, not by us the stats that shows you all sorts of activity about the history of iWire and visualizes all the, you know, all the activity that's happened. This was built by a player. And so we engage our community beyond just mapping the cubes. We created API channels so that they can access all sorts of data, live data about the game. We provide them development support when we can <laughs> to help them. We have uh, sort of undocumented API, but they love to play around with it. And we even have kind of a, in our settings menu, which is quite extensive, we just launched this new add-on section. So all of these settings are not made by us. They're made by our citizen scientists. And the beauty of that is that we have these developers who are the players, and they know the other players. And so they're creating the features that the community wants for the community, which frees up our time to build things that we think the community wants. <laughs> uh, but it's a, it's a relatively new development, I would say, in the past six months that we've suddenly had this upspring of it's, it's only three developers, but they're very active and they're constantly building new things within the iWire ecosystem. Um, and the last thing I kind of wanted to mention, so we have, uh, we have a pretty detailed achievement system in iWire, and I'll go back to my slides after this, um, and I do have a little section on you know, gamification and on badging, but we reward players for you know, their incremental improve, uh, incremental progresses, and we have various categories of badges that are linked to like points or cubes or trailblazes, like being the first person. Um, but we also have these kind of one-off badges that are related to our competition. So this, that was from Space Dinosaurs, of course. Um, but all they, we, we do limited edition kind of like profile badges. We would normally say swag, but I learned at dinner that swag is like a camping thing here. <laughs> so so it, they're, they're badges now. They'll just, <laughs> they'll just be badges. Uh, and it's a huge motivating factor, actually, for our, for our power players when, um, when we, they, they want all the badges uh, reasonably because they're kind of cute and they're kind of cool. Um, and it also shows your activity in, in the game and like it, your profile is publicly visible to anybody else in iWire. Uh, as well as the badges, we have these accuracy bars that show you, you know, so this, it, Atani, she's one of our power players as well. Um, she's a zookeeper in Arkansas and she was really excited about all the Australian animals as well. Uh, so she's got great accuracy, right? 97.3, 97.6%. Their accuracy bar changes color to blue when it's over 95%. So no power player would ever be caught dead without a blue accuracy bar. So these small design choices that signal expertise and recognize people for being awesome at your citizen science project have a big impact within the community in which they live. So I encourage you guys to think about how you can visualize uh, and give recognition to the people who are your power participants uh, in the project. So, okay, there, I'll, I'll 
tell them later. I'm gonna run back to my slides over here. Yeah, so iWire is kind of our, is our current project. We have this new project, Neo, that's coming out where, you know, the AI for Neo is a thousand times better than the AI in iWire, and it's presenting a really interesting challenge because almost all of the tasks that would have been done by beginner players are all automated now. So it's a game purely for experts, which presents different design challenges. And as you guys adopt machine learning into your own citizen science projects, you know, if you end up doing that, um, it will you know, present a challenge of how do you, how do you train your new players uh, as well. So you know, we, have, we have a lot of participation, but it's not just like the number of players. There's less active than a quarter million players. But we have a really highly engaged and very active power player community. And they are regularly online. They are often coming up with amazing new ideas for the project. And we engage with them on a much deeper level than just the average player who is in iWire. Like we know them on a first name, username kind of basis because we get to chat with them in real time and chat. You know, so how, how have we done this? Like, how do we keep these people, and how do we recruit these people? Um, and who are they? <laughs> so I got a little section in here on demographics of iWire. You might be wondering, you know, who's, who's playing this game? So our age is pretty spread out. We've got a lot of people across a lot of different age groups. Um, and our gender, well, maybe not interestingly because it's gaming, uh, it comes out to be 60% male. So this is from a, a survey that we conducted with the players. It's not like from Google Analytics kind of gender breakdown. Um, however, if you look a little closer at this gender part, and you don't just survey all the players, if you look at the power players, you see that it's 60% female. So. We've done, yeah, thanks, we're excited, <laughs> it's great. Uh, and we talked to a lot of people in gaming and we're like, why? We thought all the gamers were guys, what's going on? Uh, and it, it's, a, it's a puzzle game. You know, we're not a first person shooter game. We are a collaborative game that's about building. Even when we have competitions, they're friendly competitions. So uh, it, it seems to attract a lot of women to excel and it's a really, it's fun to be a part of, very supportive of, of one another. Um, interestingly, our user base is not a lot of citizen scientists. So we are either recruiting new people to citizen science <laughs> or operating you know, mostly exclusively. Um, but what we do know is that they're gamers. And we are having a lot of people sign up. We have you know, 100 or 200 new people sign up every day for iWire. And so at least a lot of people are getting exposure to this new realm of, of citizen science. So gamification, right? It's a game. We've got an online digital game, but I, I know that a lot of citizen science projects are not online digital games. So how can you get a little bit of gamification into your project, and should you? I think that you should. It's extremely motivating to our players to have these checkpoints. You know, if you're wanting someone to do a lot of tasks, if you can somehow give them a goal, then you can motivate them to work a little bit harder, stay a little bit longer. And we have players that, as they become kind of very active in the game, they say they have to play iWire for like three hours a day in order to get the next badge by X date. So it's very, we find it to be very motivating. Um, and you know, I, I want to say also gamification, it doesn't have to be a full game, right? So you don't think about maybe Facebook as being a game because there's not really like a leaderboard or a score. But there is. It's just not shown like a game. You know, when you get a when you get feedback, gamification is just about giving feedback and giving people that little thing that's going to give them a hit of dopamine that feels rewarding and wants them to come back for more. So you can do little tiny things, right? Like having badges, having a leaderboard, etc. Um, and if you don't want to make your own badges, you should try Mozilla's Open Badge program. Uh, they've got a whole bunch of badges that you can use and APIs, and you can just plug and play, drop them right into your site. It makes things super easy. Um, another thing, uh, badges make a good share point. So anytime someone signs up for a competition or a badge or does any kind of little game-related thing in iWire, we give them an opportunity to share and to tweet. So this is from a few hours ago. This person. They made a whole Twitter account just so they could make this tweet because I looked at it and there was one tweet. And this is it. 
I joined Crew Mecca for, for Mecca versus Kaiju and iWire. <laughs> this is the art for our competition, yeah. <laughs> um, so it, it allows people to kind of share and go out and, and recruit their friends as well. So engagement. Um, we recruit the media. You know, iWire has had a lot of news coverage, and it's not like the media just magically found us. We send emails, like when we, I dug up this email that was from when we first launched iWire, and it was a really short email, you don't even need to read it all, just I want to show you the link. It's a short email that was like, hey, you know, I saw that you write about science, we're launching this new project that does X, if you'd be interested in writing about it, it'd be awesome, you know, let me know if you have any questions kind of thing. And we sent out a lot of those, and it was super helpful because when we first launched iWire, there were a lot of news articles that came out, and we still do this. Um, we have a, a Creative Commons publicly available media gallery on Flickr, so anytime we're doing something new and interesting, we have like a list of press people in a Google, uh, Google spreadsheet that we send updates to, and there's actually a lot of media people that have asked us to send them updates when we do anything interesting. So I think if you can produce an interesting image and you can tell a really short little story, then there's an action point, of course, that participate in citizen science. It does the journalist's job, not for them, but it makes it really easy for them to write a compelling story and get a pretty picture to put on their social media. Um, also, I want to bring your attention to Google Ad Grants. Uh, if you are not operating out of an academic institution, so anybody who's at a school, you're, you're out. But if you're not at a school and you have a nonprofit that is a registered nonprofit with the government of Australia or whatever country you live in, Australia and New Zealand are both on there, uh, you can apply and win a Google ad grant. And you don't even have to win, you just have to apply and they will give it to you. And they will give you $10,000 every month in free Google AdWords for your project. So you might even want to just set up a nonprofit to go with your project so you can get this because, <laughs> because it sends a lot of people. In, in iWire, I, I pulled some of our stats. 45% of our traffic in iWire this is, is coming from our paid Google AdWords. I mean, it's really, it's, it's a significant amount of people. Um, and also, if you're not using Google Analytics for your project, you really should be because they give you a lot of information about who's coming, uh, age info, you know, I don't know if, if, it may not be as relevant for, you know, out in the field, but we, Google Analytics has uh, added a lot of new features. Some of them are even kind of creepy, like you can get the interests of the people who are participating in your project. Um, <laughs> but you know, we don't really go that far. We just look at how many people are coming and like what search terms they're using. So if there's like a lot of, a lot of people coming to your site from a certain search term, maybe you want to make a video that will pop up when they use that search term to find your project. Uh, we find that Facebook's our top social refer referrer, referrer that's followed by YouTube and then Twitter. So a lot of people find iWire from YouTube. Uh, community. So iWire would be nothing without an emphasis on community. You know, there's a huge amount of competition for the gaming world and you know, for citizen science as well. And we treat our players as a part of our lab because they are. They're not just users that are nameless people doing work for us. They are a part of our team and we treat them that way and we ask them, or am I out of time? Five minutes, okay. <laughs> I'm gonna go really fast <laughs> through the rest of this. Um, so we, we engage with everybody on a wholesome level and we, we really value their feedback. Um, that said, you can, uh, you can go wrong with your community. I don't know if you guys have ever experienced this. When we had a, a bug that was actually from Chrome, but it was very hard for us to fix and it took a long time and it had really, really bad effects and we, we've learned to be a lot clearer, like have development blogs and whatnot. Um, and also, in our case, it's, we, we changed a big thing in the UI and we did some beta tests, but we did not do enough. Uh, so if you're changing something major about your project, be sure to get the buy-in from the people who are using it enough. Um, and when you think you have the buy-in, go a little farther just to make sure. Um, crowdsourcing squared, so I talked a little bit about this. Um, you know, we have, you, you guys already saw these features, but you know, basically we have a lot of player developed add-ons into iWire that have made the game so much more usable and so much more wonderful for the whole community. And it's not just developers, so you guys saw this image that was at the beginning of my presentation. Um, this was made by Kefe Anthony Hernandez, he's one of our iWire players who's a 3D animator. So we provide OBJ 3D models of our 
uh, neurons that were mapped to our players. And we also have some animations in the works from a player, Nesterov, who's making these really complicated animations to show how the science works. So in your cases, maybe you could show, uh, you could provide raw data and get your participants to help you maybe visualize it or do all, all sorts of other things. We've, we've really just had a great success with kind of visualizing everything. And I, I personally really love design, and I think that iWire would not be where it is if we didn't have a strong emphasis on design. Um, you know, that said, design is expensive, but what we do is we offer a four-credit internship. We have a partnership with several schools in the Boston area, uh, and we offer user interface, user experience, illustration, uh, videography. You guys should get a videography intern for you guys, and they get credit for working on iWire. And the added benefit is that then you get a creative person who probably doesn't have science background who is coming in and learning a little bit about science and um, who will hopefully go on and continue to use that uh, in their you know, postgraduate uh, world. It's been really helpful, and a lot of the things that I don't, I don't know how much time. Like they think of these things outside the box. So we needed this, this animation for this website that we're building—a really serious website about neuroscience, visualizing something about how the brain works. And this 19-year-old made this. We have interns that are creating amazing content for iWire. Um, and also, we recently, well, not that recently, but our sign-up page used to have a lot of information on it. It used to have, like, share this, do this, da-da-da-da. We removed everything except for the most minimal requirements to sign up and participate in iWire. Just choose the username, then the box drops down and asks you for your email address and a password. Um, but it tripled our registration rate from new users by just removing everything else, so making it as simple as possible to participate. Um, we have a narrative in iWire. Um, I don't know that a narrative is necessarily needed for all projects. However, I think crafting some way of storytelling the scientific journey that you are on with your citizen scientists is very helpful. And so we've created these like heroes of neuroscience and they're kind of sci-fi characters that uh, have these space suits and we do these, these illustrations by interns that uh, that create these fanciful UIs, and th these are the players of iWire using these sci-fi suits to do their superpowers, which is helping to save neuroscience. So it doesn't have to be you know, this crazy illustrated kind of thing, but some way, somewhere on your site, there should be a story of you know, why you're doing what you're doing, and to make it something that someone can go to the dinner table with their friends who are not scientists and be really excited to share. Um, something that you know has maybe a, a hint of something that's like lighthearted and, and chill, uh, and it's an online game. So the favorite character of our players is this guy Neuro, it's the flying cat in a jetpack, and <laughs> he's he's loved by all. <laughs> he's really the secret like sauce of everything. Um, oh yeah, we do competitions as well. So I don't know if you guys do competitions for your projects, but you know having people compete to who can tag the most things out in the field or who can find the most unique species. Our competitions vary. So this one is a neuroscience themed one. It's GABA versus glutamate. GABA is an inhibitory neurotransmitter. Sleepy girl. And uh, glutamate is an excitatory neurotransmitter. So this competition allows them to kind of learn a little bit about neuroscience and also be like, are you like a chill, sleepy person? Or are you like hyper and really excited? You know which one I am. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, but they're not always neuroscience. Like this is our Valentine's one, sweet versus spicy. They're principally made to be funny. And I'm showing you guys this because your competitions don't have to always be 100% about your science. They can be things that are not necessarily totally related, that just get people to share and bring their friends in, but that add an element of, you know, of competition. We do regularly scheduled events as well. So if you're going to do a competition, if you can only do one, make it so that it happens the same time, the same day, you know, like every week or every month, because that makes it really easy for people to keep up. We have competitions that switch the time, and there's much lower participation rate, except you know, for happy hour happens every Friday at the same time, and like, everybody knows when it says it's super easy to remember. Um, and we also give away prizes. So, in our, well, we give away some t-shirts and stuff, but this is a neuron 
naming poster. So we do marathon competitions in Iowa where we try to get the, neuro, the players to map a cell as fast as they possibly can, and all the players who do a certain minimum number of cubes get to vote on a name, and all the players who do really a lot of cubes in 24 hours get to nominate a name. This name, Arania Exumai, was from some Harry Potter fans in iWire. It was a neuron that looked really much like a spider. I think that's the spell you use to kill a spider. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so uh, we also you know, tie into the, the modern things, like the Olympics are going on right now, so we have our own version of the Winter Games in iWire, and those competitions are very much meant to improve your skill in the game, uh, and we engage the players, so we do, for example, Evil Cubes, which is really, really hard cubes in iWire that the players themselves, who performed really well on the past version of Evil Cubes, they pick them, they select them for the community, they get a special badge at the end, and um, so it's really just crowdsourcing all the way through. But it makes it really fun, and it, it's an extra challenge. I think I'm out of time, but SciComm's last thing. When we publish a paper, I make extra figures, and they're figures for the, pa for the players. Um, our research is... You know, it's complicated, of course. It's neuroscience. It's computational neuroscience. And we are, are mapping out... <laughs> we're mapping out circuits and we're modeling how circuits work, right? It's like second order differential equations and it's not really light reading. So we create extra information. So in this case, we uh, have a new preprint publication that has identified like six new types of cells, six totally new neurons that gamers discovered. And the naming schema in the paper is really difficult and confusing to understand. It just takes a long time. So we just create extra material that makes it so that you can kind of glance and understand how we name these cells, like 38CTO. It's like it's very scientific naming, but it really helps to communicate um, the, the output of the science that the players helped with. Alas, but not least, it's fun. You know, like you've got to have fun. So we do a lot of things that are not related to the core values of iWire. And we team up with lots of design studios. And we give a lot of things away. And we always invite and welcome our players into the lab. Um, which is here. So I just want to say thank you to our whole team that's at Princeton and iWire and all of our amazing interns that I think iWire wouldn't be as beautiful without them. So our rally call for science. <laughs>